Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your eternal presence this morning. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that you walk among the churches. You search the heart, the mind, the thoughts. Uh, you're intimately acquainted with all of our ways, uh, the ways of this church and each and every heart. Uh, we bless you for your presence. We thank you that you inhabit the praise of your people. We thank you, Lord, that you know all there is to know about us. And we thank you that you love us deeply all the same. We thank you that your uh, heart this morning is filled toward each and every one of us. May we be ever mindful of that. And Lord, we gather this morning to worship you, and we pray that our hearts would be full as well. Uh, as David said, uh, my cup runs over. Uh, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Uh, we bless you, Lord, uh, this morning uh, for your presence, and may it be a great, great comfort uh, to each heart that's here. And Father, we pray that your comfort would also extend to those who aren't here today, uh, those who are struggling physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Uh, there are so many things, Lord, that I don't know about, so many things that are in our hearts, uh, so many things that weigh your people down. And uh, you know it all, uh, and that, that's why we ask and pray <clears throat> that you would comfort your people. I pray that your people would be ever mindful of the presence of Christ in their life and in their heart. We thank you that the Holy Spirit takes up residence. And we pray, Lord, that you would extend great comfort and great peace, especially during tri times of trial and hardship and tribulation. Uh, we, uh, we bless you and thank you that you don't run, uh, you don't uh, give up, you don't walk away from us, you don't disown us, uh, you have loved us with an everlasting love. And we pray this morning in all these things that our hearts would be full. Uh, with the knowledge of this truth. Uh, Father, I think of what Scripture says about um, comprehending uh, the, 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 the breadth and the height and the depths of your love. And may we do that this hour, this day. Uh, Father, also, too, uh, we're ever mindful of where our country is at. Uh, they've walked... Our leaders have walked away from you. Uh, they've become politicians to the core. Uh, many do not love God. Uh, many just seem to go their own way. Uh, oh, how uh, our country has fallen. And uh, we see uh, the... the uh, the reward, uh, so to speak, of, of what has been sown. And our hearts uh, are disturbed. Our hearts break. Uh, we even see it with, uh, within our communities and our extended families. And again, Lord, as I've prayed, uh, we pray that you would send a revival, uh, that hearts would be set on fire and lit a flame uh, for the glory of Christ, uh, the only Savior, the only God among men by whom we might be saved, and even our country, Lord. Uh, there's no hope uh, except uh, for you to save our country. Again, we thank you for your presence. We pray that uh, the word of God would administer to our hearts uh, uh, the song. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we have our first scripture reading. Bill? Our first reading this morning is from the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, verses 35 through 39, and that's found on page 1097 of the church Bible. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of our God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of our Lord. In keeping with today's theme, this morning's second scripture reading from the New Testament is from the Gospel of John. From the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, reading verses 9 through 17, and that starts on page 1046 in the Red Church Bibles. Again, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Another tremendous passage of scripture, O to be called a friend of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, may you speak to our hearts right now, and may we, may you find fertile ground in our hearts this morning uh, to receive your word, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So, folks, uh, what's today? Valentine's Day, right? Okay, so today's Valentine's Day, and it's a great day to officially and informally communicate our love to loved ones and those uh, who have uh, um, hopefully shown us love in return. Uh, I want to give you some facts here. Uh, $162 is the average amount spent on loved ones in Valent- on Valentine's Day in 2019. We don't have 2020 
figures because they pretty much obliterated that, right? Uh, aren't you glad you're not the average person? Yes. $162, right? Jerry, have I ever spent that on you? I don't think. <laughs> Actually, there was a, I took her to a French restaurant when we were recording, and it cost me 120 This was back in what? 1980s. 80, yeah, this is like 85 or 86. I tell her I'm still trying to get my money back. <laughs> $125. I was sick. Uh, 50, 58 million pounds of chocolate. Uh, is, was purchased in 2020. 145 million paper cards were mailed or given. I tried to find data on e-cards because uh, it was my birthday yesterday, and I. And by the way, folks, thank you for all the cards and the e-cards that were sent me. I could not find numbers on the e-cards. Um, not sure that there's any data on that yet. Over 30 percent of the couples actually dine out on Valentine's Day. $28 billion spent in 2020, only $22 billion spent uh, are estimated for 2021 today. Now, folks, that being said, uh, it's not about the money, right? It's about the thought that counts. So I was also curious about the history of Valentine's Day, and I'm going to you can kind of find it on uh, history.com if you kind of Google it. But let me kind of give you a little bit of background. It, the, the history is actually somewhat obscure. It's attributed to St. Valentine. The problem is there's three different St. Valentines. So, it, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, right? Pick, pick what Valentine you want, St. Valentine. And then here's the other problem. They were all martyred. <laughs> so, you know, um, that's an interesting one. It's also traced back to pagan roots and Greek mythology. And uh, celebrations where actually, when these celebrations took place, couples had met, and oftentimes uh, they got married. Also, Greek mythology gives rise to Cupid. Now, Cupid, there's all sorts of conjecture about Cupid, but you know, he's that fat, little, mischievous, chubby baby, you know, that kind of flings the arrow into the heart. Uh, they're not sure who his parents were in Greek mythology, right? But it's all Greek mythology. But this is the interesting thing. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, to Christianize, I put that in quotes, but to Christianize the pagans actually used Valentine's Day uh, as an opportunity for outreach. And so we, we fast forward to today, right? And it's primarily associated with romance and gift giving. Now... While Valentine's Day history is obscure and it's associated with romance and gift giving, if you go to the Bible, none of, none of that is obscure. We know the origin of love and we know the origin of gift giving, amen? It's right there in the Bible. And the Word of God tells us that God is love. He is the origin and the source of all love. Uh, we see this demonstrated early on in the book of Genesis. Oh, the grace, the mercy, and the love of God to have kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. Uh, if you were in Bible study on Wednesday, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. I mean, think about that. To, to, to keep Adam and Eve from eating of the tree of life and staying in a sinful state forever. Oh, the love of God. We know that he demonstrated his, love, demonstrated his love at Calvary. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. We see the, his love daily, do we not? If you, you, lamentations, his mercies are new every morning. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you've experienced those loving kindnesses and loving mercies, amen? Daily. You know you know that he's forgiven you. It's unexplained. You know it. If he's forgiven you, if you have the love of God, you know it. At some point, his love has had to flood your soul. I want you to 
ponder this for a minute. You know, we, we take one day a year and we make a big thing about it. It's Valentine's Day from God's heart to us each and every day. It never ends. David, it's the thought that counts. David said, and you know the scripture, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God? How vast is the sum of them? If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. You know, uh, back in September when we were at the Outer Bank, you know, you've been to the seashore. Now, I know maybe it's a little hyperbole and it's, a, you know, it's poetry and it's metaphor, but think about the sands of the seashore. Try to number that. Uh, David captures it very, very well. And so this morning, as we are reminded about the love of God, you, you know that it's not measured in chocolates and candy and cards, and it's not calculated in money. And you know it's measured in the giving of a son, in the giving of himself to each and every one of us. Paul essentially tells us in Romans chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That, the separation, folks, do you ever think about this? The separation, God, it, it's impossible. It, the separation from the love of God to his children cannot be measured. It's not possible. And you know, yet it's sad that there are more than just a few believers who walk this earth, who th this very moment question the love of God to their hearts. How, how is that possible? Are, are they dismissive of this passage in Romans 8? It's sad, very, very sad, that you can think that you are, could be ever separated from the love of God if you have received Him as your Lord and Savior. That's a very, very bleak Christian existence and living. You know, I've shared this before. Maybe you have similar stories. But it's worth noting, maybe you know, if you don't have a similar story, maybe you can relate to somebody who has. You know, I said before, you know, I had a father, I had a father growing, I remember at age five, he was gone. That was it. Age five. I never heard the words, I love you. His love was never demonstrated. It was never shown. Never hugs and kisses. I totally doubted whether my father ever loved me or not. He was never there. He separated. It was never shown. Maybe you can relate to that experience. Maybe it wasn't a father. Maybe it was a mother. Or maybe you know of an aunt or uncle who left their family and they were just devastated. There's, there's no few examples to choose from in our society today. Amen? Sadly. On the contrary, I never doubted my mother's love. Like many of you probably never doubted one of your parents or both of your parents' love. I heard it. It was shown through the good, the bad, and the ugly. I constantly had the hugs and the kisses. I constantly knew that she loved me. She would say it. I wasn't ashamed as a teenager or a 13-year-old to hug and kiss my mom in public. She loved that one. <laughs> but you know, you know it when somebody loves you, amen? How can people live, how can believers live with the thought that God might not love them today? Might love them tomorrow and not, might not love them next week? That's insane. I know, I know this, you know, when I blew it, my mother doubled down. She didn't disown me. She doubled down, tripled down, quadrupled down. That's what moms do, right? That's what dads should do too. I remind you this morning of the love of God to your hearts. He has covered a multitude of our sins. Not one, but all of them. All of them. And what better reminder than to come to the eternal word of God, and it stands forever, right? You know that. What better book to come to and to be reminded of that this morning? 
You know, if somebody makes a promise, sometimes, you know, you have to be reminded of it. Sometimes you don't know if they're going to deliver. God never fails. His love never fails. We just sung about it, right? I've said this in the 30-some years I've been here, and you know it if you've been here that long. This is a history book. It's a history of the love of God to the world. It's a love letter that communicates verbally his promises. It's a love letter written in his blood, and it's to you and to me, and it's for you and for me. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatever is written in earlier times, that is the Old Testament, was written for our instruction. Whatever means, not everything has been recorded, but everything that needed to be recorded for our good to know his love is perfect and true. It's all here. Again, it's like saying to your little kid, don't touch the hot oven. Go to the table. There's a spread of food. God gives it all to us. It's all there for our good. Whatever it takes to get our attention. Whatever it takes to make us look up or bow the knee or to come back into the fold. He knows it all. He knows how to figure it out. You know, as a pastor, sometimes people come to me and they say, Pastor, I got this problem. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't always answer, give them the right answer. I, I sadly, years ago, I counseled this one person and I struck a nerve and they never came back. And it breaks my heart when I think about that. But God always knows the right thing to do and the right thing to say and how to orchestrate it. And sometimes maybe I just should learn to get out of the way. But you know, when you try to help somebody, you know, sometimes we don't always do that. The scripture says God always knows. He's the perfect heavenly father. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 reminds us that scripture is for teaching, to rebuke us, correction, training in righteousness. Folks, I need that. I need that more than anybody else. The Word of God is an invitation to be as Valentine. Janelle, I like the fact that you put the red letters in the sermon title, Be My Valentine. It's an invitation for each and every one of us this morning, a fresh or if you haven't never done that, if you've never asked Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. This is a, uh, an invitation this morning to be his valentine. Now, I cannot show you any place in Scripture where the words literally say, be my valentine. But that's the spirit of Scripture, is it not? Is that a, not a, a foregone conclusion? So it's not the letter of the law, but it, it's definitely the spirit of the law. In John chapter 15, verse 13, another great verse, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Is that not a be my valentine statement? Of course it is. Of course it is. If that doesn't touch on the Be My Valentine, nothing does in all of Scripture. You know, many moons ago, and I mean many moons, uh, back in grade school, uh, maybe you remember some of the experiences, you know, you give out the little tag card gifts, Be My Valentine, you give little candies to your friends, and, you know, you're maybe the people that sat around you in grade school. Yeah, I went to Catholic school, so that was a big thing, you know. You do the Valentine thing, right? And, you know, I've said this before years ago, you get all these little sugared heart candies and they have all these sayings on them, right? And, and so what happens is you start giving them out to people. I remember a few times where I was extremely disappointed that I never received the card or candy, especially from the girl that you had the crush on, right? But, you know, or say, you know, a friend. You know, you give them something, and they don't give you anything. It's like, really? Disappointed, right? 
They, they didn't respond in kind. Oh, I guess they didn't think about me. You know, it's funny because I tried to start to reflect on that. I think there were times where I was also the guilty party. I got stuff from people and I never gave them anything. Now, take that and try to make it personal. You know how you love somebody, you give somebody something, you reach out, it's the thought that counts, and you never get anything back. It hurts. Uh, Jesus spoke about laying down his life for his friends. How many of us lay down our lives for him? You know, it's a, it's a consumerism type church today, is it not? What kind of candy can I get? What kind of cards can I get to make me feel good? But a lot of times it's just one way. That's very sad. John chapter 15, uh, verses 9 through 17, Jesus spoke about laying down his life for his friends. Uh, you may know this. The context is the night before he died. Upper room discourse. It's after the parable of the vine and the branches. And the vine and the branches, I've said this before, say it again. It's so important that you know this because there are many people who run around and say, do you see this passage teaches you can lose your salvation? It's got nothing to do with that. This passage is relational. The parable of the vine and the branches is relational. It's fellowship. It's about staying connected. And so are verses 9 through 17. It's about fellowship. It's relational. It's about staying connected. Now, Jesus asks a very, very profound, uh, or uh, uh, makes a very, very profound comment about remaining in his love in these verses here. He asks, he, he doesn't so much ask it as a question, but he says, as a, remain in my love. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? It has nothing to do with God not loving us anymore. May it never be. That's not possible. It has everything to do with a reciprocating love. That's what it has to do with. It's relational. It's responding to Him. Keeping His commandments. Loving Him. Loving others. Because that's, he's, 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 he's not going to be around. And He talks about the apostles loving one another. And in doing so, you and I then have the capacity to love other people and to show the love of Christ to other people. Back to the analogy of will you be my valentine. God is looking for a response to his love, amen? Just like, you know, when you give the candy, you don't, you don't always give the candy and the card or a gift where you expect something in return. But it's nice, isn't it? It's wonderful when somebody's responsive to us. A reciprocating love. Us showing love back to him and us communicating his love to others. And if, folks, it, it cannot be done, it cannot be done if we're not connected to him. It's just not possible. Just like it's not possible for us to remain in his joy if we're not walking with him. It just doesn't happen. This made me think back to times where I was dating before I got married. Did you ever have somebody dump you? Always on the, I was always on the dumping end, pretty much. <laughs> I did some dumping, but I actually got dumped more than I did the dumping. And, uh, but, you know, man, it hurts, doesn't it? It, it's painful. It hurts. It, to ever be rejected, to have your love rejected, uh, it's, it's just awful. It's totally awful. You know, I wonder how God feels about that. Do you ever stop and think about uh, 
the heart of God and how he feels. You know, he, he loves this world, sent his son, gave up everything that people might have everything. And they just don't even respond. You know it. You shared, you shared the gospel, right? And some, sometimes when you, you get rejected and beat up with it, you don't really want to share it again because you know what's coming. But it hurts. It hurts. Not to be loved. It hurts to be rejected. Years ago, I may have shared this with you. I think I did. Ronald Reagan was married, before he was married to Nancy, he was married to Jane Wyman. I think that's right, Jerry, right? Jane Wyman is an actor here. They went through a divorce. It was not initiated by him. He was a Democrat at the time. Can you imagine that, Ronald Reagan being a Democrat? He must have had like a salvation experience or something. He saw the light. But, you know, he went from a Democrat to being a Republican. But at the time, he was a Democrat and she was a Republican. And she divorced him because they couldn't get along politically. And I know his heart was broken. I know his heart was broken. But when asked by a reporter one time about that relationship, he said, the worst thing was coming home and having nobody to love. But I'll tell you what was behind that, I'm totally convinced, was because she rejected his love. You know, uh, you know, I, I, my brother, my, my brother went through a divorce, and it, uh, it ripped his heart out. I've known of people that go through a divorce; it rips their heart out. Back to John 15 here. Jesus is not making the point that he doesn't have anybody to love. Uh, he loves a lot of people, a whole bunch of people. Uh, this is not the problem. Divorce is not mentioned in these verses. But he's stressing the need to remain in his love. Not divorce from it. Not separate from it. Uh, that's the only way that we're able to truly love. That's the proper order. Him first, others second. You know the uh, great chapter on 1 Corinthians 13. The great chapter on love. God exalts. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, amen? amen? That's the one thing that remains. The one thing that will remain. I will tell you, you can never go wrong to remind people of their love. You can, you can never go wrong you can never, ever, ever go wrong when you remind people of, their, of his love. It gets more mileage than judgment or wrath, amen? It get, you tell people that God wants to forgive them, gets more mileage than God wants to reprimand them. I know. <laughs> I've been the recipient of it. You know, uh, many, want, many want the love they want people's love. They want friends' love. They want the love of God. But they don't want to give it in return. That hurts. That's a Valentine one way. You know, they name streets that are one way, right? It's an awful thing not to love in return. It's an awful thing not to love God when He has shown so much love. In closing, I remind you that God is looking for a response to be his valentine. I don't have to worry about that with my wife. I don't have to say, oh, I know that she loves me. But have you, but God is looking for a response. And does, does he know that you love him? Have you, have you responded to him? Have you told him that? You know, when you love somebody or you fall in love, don't you feel like the heart flutter a little bit? Kind of throbs. 
gets excited, you know, when you're around that person. God, God's heart flutters and throbs and is so excited over each and every one of us as his children. That's why he says, won't you be my valentine? What's your response? I was praying this morning that I would love God more than anything else, anyone else in this world. That's my prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. And all these people sitting in this sanctuary right now, and even as it extends to so many people outside these walls, uh, may we be ever mindful of that. May we own the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, may we be responsive to his great, great love. And may we take that message and share it uh, with those that we come in contact with in the world. Uh, we bless you for this time. We ask your blessing upon our time and our meeting in the other building. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.